So you, you mentioned that like developers try to appeal to millions of people now. And that almost seems like one of the worst things about this industry is that like every like right now all of our interests are just divided into niches and we all have our separate tastes. But companies try to appeal to everyone and then you get like this product that's kind of diluted. So now you're an indie team and yes. you're trying to get crowdfunding. Are you yeah. trying to appeal to everyone in this huge market or are you just trying to appeal to like the amnesia crowd who well, thank, might be small but they're at least thank you for, thank you of accusing me of trying to appeal to a lot of people I've well no accused. i'm not accusing you of that. <laughs> no no no, no 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 I, I'm, I'm just joking um, i've been accused of many things but yes. never being never being appealing um, <laughs> um the um um certainly learned a lot and i would say i would say no i would say we know that what we're doing is not going to sell 20 million copies. We're trying to create a game that is, in, quite frankly, in order to be provocative, um, and you're going to go places that other people haven't gone, you will create something that is very popular, but it's it's not going to go down the road that is going to have all the checklists for marketing. It's going to go down the road where it's going to be an awesome experience. And it could be a huge hit, and that would be amazing. That would be terrific, and no one would be upset about that. But it it, it kind of, you know, it's, it, it just brings me back to the days when we were creating Legacy of Kane. When we were creating Legacy of Kane, uh, the first game, it was uh, a, a North American game um, on the consoles, our first console game, you know, being created with an anti-hero. It was 2D, not 3D. And no one thought that it would be as appealing as it was to people. But it had its own soul, and Shadow of the Eternals is going to have its own soul. And I think, um, you know, hopefully it'll appeal to enough people to get funded and to hit the right spots. But we know where we want to take it. We know where the order wants to take this game, and we're razor sharp on it. And um, you know, if we try to appeal to everyone, it's just going to get watered down and go back down that AAA shoot. And it's not, it's not what we want. So I, I. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of room for that, and you know, power to all those guys making you know all those great titles. It's just not that's not what we're built for. Uh, so we've seen um, some of the biggest survival horror developers say, you know, we have to make our new game more mainstream and more action and more accessible because there isn't that audience anymore that's big enough to support these like like a Dead Space three. Like we've seen we've seen that kind of over and over. Do you think that that's true or do you think that like a really good transcendent horror game can still be really popular yeah I, I don't believe that that's true I guess I so I know what I want to play I've watched so many horror films I'll go to a horror film alone if I have to but luckily I have a friend of mine who will he, he will come with me and we watch a lot of bad horror but sometimes we get that gem yes and it's just like yes and um, when I'm there I see a wide demographic, women, men, teenagers, adults, and I don't believe, it. what I think is happening right now, honestly, is the industry is so tough and it's so hard to make money that we as an industry don't know how to market to that group properly to make it enough. And don't get me wrong, if you come into a title with 60 or an $80 million budget, well then yeah, it's really hard to make money. <laughs> yeah. But if you come into it at a reasonable budget, and you hit that demographic right, um, you have a chance to do something that's special. And so, I guess maybe maybe we're maybe I'm a dreamer, maybe, but I believe that it's possible. And I'm not saying I'm not discounting those guys' experience who said all that because they have a lot of experience, and I get it. The industry is tough, but I still think it's out there. It to me, uh, it reminds me. I remember at one point people say horror was dead. Then boom, the ring came out. Then suddenly. A Ringu. Suddenly, yeah. all this Japanese horror just exploded, and it came out of nowhere. Yep. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I think it just happens in cycles. And yeah, we're in a down cycle right now. Maybe, or we were in a down cycle for horror, um, but maybe there'll be a time where it'll just uptick. And at the end of the day, we're creating something that we want to play, and at least we'll know we'll, we'll please ourselves. And now that we're working with the order, we're also creating things that we think our fans are going to like to play as okay. well. So it seems like one of the things that kind of, I shouldn't say ruined, but kind of took horror games down this path was empowering players. Because Resident Evil 2, you were weak and you died immediately. Oh yeah. 
Resident Evil 4, you could you could take care of yourself, and that's kind of where it's gone now. So, like, how do you view? Because there's combat in Shadow of the Eternal. Oh yeah, for like, sure. Like, how do you view combat? How strong is your character? Do you fear threat and death? Well, so, I, I, you know, that I think is one of the pitfalls of AAA development, and um, one of the check marks is how cool is your character? How much can people identify with him? It they get to the point where they become almost a comic book superhero. Yeah. Where they're a pit, super people. And if you look back at Eternal Darkness, we had people that are out of shape. We had people that never fought before. We had people that there's just no way they should be in the positions that they're in, but they're heroes and they die. And that is true uh, poetics from Aristotle because that's real life. And every time I see, as soon as you start taking horror and you make the character a superhero, it transcends from horror to fantasy. And that's, I think, what's been happening. And I think um, that's the mistake. I think it's really easy to correct. Yeah, make your characters weak. Make them so, um, from the demo that you saw, how powerful did Clara look? You know, Bathory, well, she's something else. <laughs> but I think it's safe to say, too, that she has her issues. And, um, but creating a provocative story is all about being human. and. Horror is about not knowing if you're going to survive around the corner, not if you're a steroided up character, how many how many 10,000 zombies are they going to kill? Because uh, Lovecraft in general, the, the bottom line is if you actually come in contact with some of these ultimate beings, you are, you're, it's over. You just can't, you can't deal with it. So you got to figure out other ways of dealing with it. So how do you imagine that uh, the combat is going to work in, in this game? Oh, uh, combat is going to be what I would say very tactical, very thoughtful, um, very, um, mm, uh, the word that I would look for, I guess, is paced in a way that's very deliberate and uh, not um, how fast can you run and gun because running and gunning is not realistic. So we're going to have sanity is going to play in a, a part, magic is going to play a part and tactically using your environment and using um, what weapons you have that are going to be historically accurate to you. Okay. Uh, just seeing the demo, you, you kind of explained like this game has puzzles, but not in the traditional sense. It almost seems like the puzzles are built into the environment themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and it kind of reminded me of something like Dark Souls where you have to figure out the story. Mm -hmm. um, like how, sure. how big of, how important is that to like not spoon feed players uh, every, every little thing in this game? Or is it, or is it going to, fall down that same mistake that so many developers do where they just don't trust the people who play. Oh, I'm so I'm so hesitant <laughs> to, you know, criticize what I would say. I, I guess what we're trying to do is get people into a flow of things where the game unfolds naturally. And I guess the way I would describe how we want the puzzles to be would be uh, within context of the story. So whenever I see a game that you're playing and um, you're doing something, then out of the blue, there's this, I guess that's one of my biggest criticisms of some of the old, you know, genre of, here's this diamond stuck in the middle of the wall. Like if we're walking around here, <laughs> there's some diamond combo on the wall, that, that doesn't make any sense. So let's create things that are in context with the environment in which you're in that would make sense. And we've got thousands of years of human history. There's a lot of stuff we can do, but let's not have that, you know, purple ruby puzzle that works perfectly with the, you know, the pearl puzzle or whatever it's going to be. Uh, we'll keep it in context. So I think some of the reasons that you end up having a spoon feed is because you fall into that one trap, and then you fall into well, this is out of context. And what we would like to do, and it, it, hey, I'm not. Hopefully, we'll do it well. But the goal is going to be to create these puzzles that are so in context of the player that they come naturally and they flow. It's like reading a book, and you're just. You're just like, oh, watching a movie. You're just going through and you're experiencing the game as it should be experienced. Okay. So you, you, are, you are at least cognizant of the mistakes AAA games make? Oh, yeah. I, I don't want to say that I'm not cognizant. I would say, hey, look, the old Dennis criticized a lot of things. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard to make games. And yeah. I, I would say um, we're trying to do something that we believe in and trying to make the experience the best possible. We're definitely not trying to be a AAA. We're not, we can't be, first of all, we don't have the funding. But secondly, I don't think that that's a good direction to go in. Um, there's enough people doing that, and I think it's a really hard road to hoe now. 
um, where we want to do things. Um, I think with all the different things we're doing, so here's, an ex here's where I'm really excited. You take, I talked about Legacy of Kane. We used that disc, we had no text. Really cool. So for the first time we had an RPG with no text and it was all voice acting. It's where we got seriously into voice acting. With Eternal Darkness, we had some cool technology with the camera. We had the sanity effects broke the fourth wall. Lots of characters died. I had someone up at Comic-Con go, you were doing Game of Thrones before Game of Thrones. I was like, we were, I said. I didn't even <laughs> think about that. That's cool. Um, and um, so stuff like that. So that's what stood out with that one. With When we worked on Metal Gear with Kojima-san, um, it was all about spectacle. We really learned how we did the cinemas because I was always blown away. I don't know. I still don't know how he does it. They get better and better all the time. But we at least learned something from that. And when I look now at Shadow of the Eternals, what we have that's really interesting, and to me, which is the game changer, is the wetware. So we have all these new hardware coming out. We've got Oculus Rift. We've got all these new consoles. They're all really great. But what we've got is a community now where we're working with thousands of people and creating content. We have more sanity effects in five weeks than we created ever by probably 10 times that we ever did in the full development cycle um, on Eternal Darkness. And that's we've just started. Imagine what we can do with the community. I think that's going to be the game changer here. And I don't pretend to know where this is going to go, but all I know is it feels really good right now. Our industry now is in a position exactly where Hollywood was in the early 20s and in the golden era of films where they're making movies like Cleopatra or Ben-Hur, where everyone was an employee. And they had thousands of staff and they made fantastic movies. Those were great movies, I still watch them today, they're amazing. But the studios looked at them and said, we're not making money, this is not working. Uh, AAA is not fine. <laughs> <laughs>